The Metruneta, Chapter 5, Volume 1. Please support this channel by checking the links below. Consider being a Patreon member, donate, or purchase the book below. Thank you for your support and enjoy the audio. Chapter 5 The Two Great Realms of Being. All potters know that the clay they work with has two fundamental states its original unformed or unordered state, and the other which is formed or ordered into things, pots, frogs, jars, and what have you. The same is true of reality. All that is real falls into one of two fundamental divisions. By fundamental is meant that there is no possibility of further division. One division corresponds to a mode of reality that is lacking in form, objectivity, definition, etc., we will call this division of chaos the subjective realm. The other division corresponds to the mode of reality in which energy or matter has been ordered into forms and objects. This division is called the objective realm due to the fact that it is in it that objects, thoughts, emotions, physical things are found. The being that is the synthesis of life in both realms is called netter in the comedic tradition. Its conceptualization goes beyond the concept of the supreme Godhead that is used by most spiritual traditions to represent the supreme being. All manifestations of itself through which it creates and maintains the world, including the Godhead, Neber Cher, Lord of the World, are called the Neteru. It is easy to see that this term is the origin of the Latin terms Natura, Neutral, Eternitus or eternity, etc. Unfortunately, more space cannot be devoted to the subject, but discerning readers will see in the comedic tradition about the Supreme Being, a deeper understanding that is to be found in other traditions who limit it to the subjective realm. For our purpose, a useful synonym for the world is the objective realm. In this book, the term objective, when referring to the world, manifested reality, etc., will always appear capitalized to distinguish our usage from one of its popular denotation, impartial, impersonal, unconditioned view, etc. The term kin to object from the prefix ab refers to all that has form and therefore denotes all that is perceptible, mentally or physically. In the same manner, we will qualify the term subjective. Excluded is the denotation of partiality, conditioned view, personal, etc. The term kin to such terms as submerged, substrata, substance, etc. From the prefix sub refers to all that is under, therefore incapable of being perceived. So we have two fundamental divisions in the realm of being one which is submerged, i.e. imperceptible, and the other perceptible. The imperceptibility of the subjective realm is based on the fact that in it there are no objects. The derivation of the name objective realm from the fact that it is the place of objects is obvious. The importance of these concepts will be realized from the consideration of the fact that most people limit their acknowledgement of reality to what is perceptible. Yet, not only is reality not limited to the perceptible, objective region, it originates beyond it in the subjective realm. The subjective realm. If there are no things in the subjective realm, what then is there? It must be comprehended, first of all, that all the objects making up the world are modifications of an eternally subsisting energy or matter. As the term exists refers to objectify reality, the term subsist must be used to refer to subjective elements in a homogeneous and unmodified state in the subjective realm. It must be understood that where there is absolutely no differentiation, there cannot be perception. Contrary to the characteristics of Western scientific thinking, the modification of this universal underlying substance, subjective energy or matter, into the set of related things we call the world does not occur by chance. 
It is the result of conscious, intelligent action. Although imperceptible, lacking form, the conscious and will of being, netter, also reside in the subjective realm. With full consciousness of itself as infinite potential of expression, netter wills its energy or matter to modify itself as the infinite of forms manifesting in as the world, the objective realm. Let's note, therefore, that the creative elements of being are imperceptible. Sof and Aur are the Canaanite names given to the unmanifested, undifferentiated energy matter in the subjective realm, while Sof corresponds to the undifferentiated feminine polarity we designate as matter, or root of aura equals light, is the undifferentiated masculine polarity we designate as energy. They are the substance and energy underlying all forms and activities in the world. In the Commission tradition, the matter side of the subjective realm is referred to as Nu, and the energy polarity Ra, pronounced Ra, hence or, Aura, Radiation, etc., in the Comedic Book of Knowing, the Manifestations of Ra, written around 2500 B.C., although the doctrine is much older, we have the words of Nebuchadnezzar, Lord of the world, which he spoke after coming into being. I am he who came into being in the form of the infinite power of manifestation, Kepera. I became the creator of what came into being. After my coming into being, many were the things which came into being, coming forth from my mouth, words of power. Not existed heaven, the noumenal division of the objective realm. Not existed earth, the phenomenal division of the objective realm. Not had been created the things of the earth and creeping things in that place. I raised them out of new from the state of inactivity of energy. Not found I a place to stand wherein. I radiated words of power with my will. I laid a foundation in the law, Mao, and I made all attributes. I was alone, for not had I spit out the form of Shu, the thermal Yang principle of the world. Not had I emitted Tefnut, the moisture, hydronoid Yin principle of the world. Not existed another who worked with me. I made a foundation by means of my will, and there came into being the multitude of things. I became from God one, God's three, that is, from out of myself. The text continues with the creation of men and other things in the world through the interaction of Shu, or Yang, and Tefnut, or Yin. Besides corroborating what has been said thus far in this chapter, it introduces a very important point that cannot be passed up. Here we have a written confirmation that monotheism existed in ancient Egypt much earlier than the birth of Abraham and over 1,000 years before Akhenaten and Moses. In the Bantu, the South African nation's tradition, subjective matter is Entu. In the Yoruba, it is Olurumare. In the Akon of West Africa, it is Nayame, etc. Let's paraphrase the above by noting that all that was, is, and can ever be are all modifications of the undifferentiated energy matter and unconditioned consciousness will of subjective being. Therefore, all that we have been, now are, and can ever be are modifications of this original subjective being. We can therefore make the following conclusions about ourselves. 1. As the energy matter, like unmolded clay, is undifferentiated, i.e. not restricted to a particular form, it can assume any shape. Its power of attainment is omnipotent. If the energy matter making up our being is rooted in this energy matter, we also partake of its omnipotence, of course, in kind, but not magnitude. 2. 
as the consciousness or will of subjective being is not conditioned by any limitations of energy matter, as there are no forms there to do so, its potential to will is unlimited. It is therefore omniscient, as our consciousness or will is rooted in the consciousness or will of subjective being, we also partake in its quality. Three, as there are no limitations of time and space in the subjective realm, being is therefore eternal and infinite, i.e. omnipresent. We also partake in this quality. This may seem to fly in the face of experience, but objections are soon dealt with by noting the fact that there are many people with spiritual abilities that are out of the ordinary, and this is one of the chief roles of a cosmogony. It enables you to know what is ahead in the field of human growth. Like a map, it guides you to where you haven't been. It keeps you from defining, delimiting, crystallizing yourself around the present level of mankind's evolutionary attainment or your growth to date. The defining of man in terms of the common faculties that mankind has thus far evolved is the chief impediment to further growth. The objective realm. It is not enough to know that the world, objective reality, is a modification of subjective being, unconditioned consciousness, and undifferentiated energy matter. We cannot understand our being, the purpose of life, and how we should live unless we have a clear understanding of how and why the subjective being creates the world, objective reality. Let's begin by recalling the notion that energy matter in the subjective realm is not differentiated into forms, the world, and that if there are no things to be perceived, then consciousness can only be conscious of being conscious. This state of consciousness can be achieved and has been achieved by humans and is called in the commission meditation system the deity, tem or timu, negative being. And in the Indus Valley system, Asam Prajnata, pure consciousness without objects of consciousness. An in-depth look at the subject will show that in the subjective realm there can only be one being. For there to be others, there must be differentiations of the energy matter into bodies which serve as the means of separating each being from the other. Infinite and eternal Unwalled by a body, this being is all alone. It is one without a second. As a thought is a differentiation of the energy matter, it isn't even thinking. It has not even the thought, I am conscious. No things, no needs, no identity. In the commission tradition, being on this level is called the deity. Amen. Meditate on your being conscious and you will get a glimpse of the fact that what in you is conscious is itself imperceptible and concealed. The subjective realm, therefore, is the hidden plane of reality where being dwells. All manifestations are the differentiations of the energy matter of this level, the objectification of the substantive basis of all forms. The reason, therefore, for the creation of the world, the differentiation of the original energy matter into things, is to give being experience. The subjective realm is life. The objective is living. Being versus doing. The slightest thought, the faintest feeling is already an objectification of energy, matter, a world in itself. All alone, without thoughts, without experience, no me and you in it. Subjective being creates, differentiates its energy matter into the world that it may have experienced. I like to use the following metaphor, although it is crude and somewhat inaccurate. Imagine yourself all alone suspended somewhere in a dark, bottomless and surfaceless expanse of water. Bored to death, aren't you? One day you realize that your body is composed of billions of cells. So you transfer your consciousness into several millions of your cells, and suddenly you are no longer alone and the adventure begins. And suppose you forgot that you are not really the cells, 
and the drama begins and goes on until you have been knocked around pretty good by some bacteria and viruses and the spiritualization begins. Yes, all alone without thoughts, feelings, or a second with whom to interact, subjective being differentiates a portion of its infinite energy matter into an enclosed circle. Within it, it differentiates its energy matter, Nu, Ra, Sof, or into billions of galaxies with their trillions of stars and how many Earths. And many of the latter it fills with people and transfers its consciousness into them and the adventure begins. Temporarily, perhaps for a short period of billions of years, the embodied, incarnated consciousness forgets that it is not really these things within which it dwells on these Earths. Then it tires of the knocks and the journey back begins. Not until, of course, every single ray of incarnated consciousness has been liberated from its earthly tomb. Men who have found the way back and stopped at the edge in the commission tradition are called Asur. In the Indus Valley tradition, Bodhisattvas. They are the only ones who truly deserve the title Sage. The mapping of the way down and back is the function of a cosmogony. The transition from absolute undifferentiation in the subjective realm to earthly existence does not proceed in one step. It is a graduated progression designed to maintain a connection at each and every step between the qualities of subjective being and the purpose of creating the world. That is to say that each step toward the manifestation of earthly existence is qualified to maintain an equilibrium between being and doing, life and living, the nothingness of subjective being, and the infinite numbers of things of the earthly plane, the infiniteness and eternalness of the subjective realm, and the finiteness in time and space of the objective realm. The Cosmogenesis of the Objective Realm the dual nature of the subjective realm, consciousness, will, and energy matter is the main organizing principle of the objective realm, which is divided into two main planes, the noumenal and the phenomenal. The noumenal plane. In this plane is found all metaphysical objective reality, the spirit of things, thoughts, images, and these metaphysical beings called angels, spirits, etc., this is the well-known plane of physical energy matter. From gluons to galaxies, each of these planes are in turn subdivided. The divisions of the noumenal plane. 1. Atsiluth. When the undifferentiated energy matter of the subjective realm is acted upon by the divine will, its first manifestation is an objectification of a portion of its substance which maintains its undifferentiated quality. This state of objective energy matter is called Atsiluth in the Canaanite Kabbalistical tradition. In the Kemitic tradition, this plane is under the dominion of the goddess Nut. Incidentally, Nut is not the sky goddess or heaven as held by Egyptologists. Sky and heaven are used as metaphors to convey the fact that what is referred to is not differentiated in space or time. Where does the sky begin? Where does it end? The sky is the emblem of the infinite, the boundless, the eternal. This holds true for all the so-called sky gods. The fact is that the realities here described, Nu and Nut, can only be contacted by going into the recesses of the mind. Close your eyes now. Didn't you find yourself looking into what resembles the night sky, dark and endless? Think about going deeper into it. We will be talking a great deal more about this in the chapters on meditation. As energy matter on this plane... Absolute is undifferentiated, that is, there is only one building element it can give rise to, only one entity. This entity is the one vehicle within which dwells all things in the world. It is the world soul, the Ba of the commissions, the Yachita of the Canaanites, the Han home of the Akon, the first aspect of the Utiwetango, of the Bantu, 
and the Ananda Maya Kasha of Hinduism. The deity that resides in this division of the spirit is the first manifestation of the Supreme Being, Asur of the Commissions, Abatala of the Yorubas, Nayakanpan of the Akan, Tara and Shiva of Indus Kush, etc. The sphere of the tree of life is Kether. It is important to realize the connections between the functions of unification represented by these deities and the fact that their environment is composed of a single building element and that there is only one body, one being at this level. We will later see that it is to this plane and in this body that people's consciousness ascends to when experiencing those highest manifestations of trance called samadhi in Hinduism. Because there is only one being on this plane, it is here that the unity between all things is inherently experienced, i.e. one experiences that all things and events in the world are one, as one experiences that all of our bodily members are parts of our body. 2. Briya is the Canaanite name given to the second level of energy matter densification. Here there are two building elements which allow for the creation of two bodies, the universal spirit, Ba, in the level above, dualizes itself to give rise to two universal spirits within itself. One is the organ system through which it wills manifestations to be. This part of the spirit is called the Ku by the commissions and the Chaya by the Canaanites. Herein dwells Chakma, the second sphere of the tree, and the wisdom deities Tehuti of the commissions, Ifa of the Yoruba, Odomankoma of the Akon, China Master of Indus Kush, etc. The other spiritual vehicle is the organ system wherein resides the seeds of the individual forces that are responsible for the actualization of the types of things that are willed to be manifested by the second sphere. This part of the spirit is called the Shechem by the commissions and Shekinah by the Canaanites. Herein resides Bina, the third sphere of the tree of life, and the deities Seker of the commissions, Kali of Indus Kush, Babalu Ae of the Eurobas, Kalunga of the Bantus, etc. These two, the second and third divisions of the spirit in the world as in man, the will and the power part of the spirit interact with each other in the manner of creative organs to bring into manifestation and to affect all things and events in as the world. Together with the first division of the spirit, the Ba, they form the great trinity which in the Kabbalistical tradition of Canaan is called the Neshama, the great divine trinity, one, the Ba, Yachida, the world soul in which all things dwell as integral parts of the one divine being, two, the Ku, Chaya, the universal divine will which initiates the manifestation of each thing and event, it appoints to each thing, its place in time and space. The Shechem, Shekinah, the universal power which carries to physical manifestation the dictates of the universal divine will through its 50 units of power. The Beni Elohim, or the 50 gates of Bina, as they are called in the Canaanite Kabbalistical tradition, and the 50 oarsmen of the boat of Asur in the Sirius Star, as they are called in the commission system, or the 50 garlands or skulls of the necklace of Kali, as they are called in Indus Kush, or the 50 matricas, wombs, little mothers, of the body of the great mother Kundalini, or Kundala. 3. The upper Yetzira is the third level in the graduated densification of energy matter toward physical manifestation. Each of the two building elements of the preceding stratum, Briya, divide themselves to create four building elements, which enable the manifestations of four great spiritual bodies, 
Although they are all referred by one common name, they are the spirits of the four great kingdoms on earth, the mineral, vegetal, animal, and human. Each of these spiritual vehicles serves as the unifying body for all of its members. When a person is able to bring his or her consciousness to this level, the experience of oneness with all other humans is achieved. For the fact that we are all integral parts of the whole represented by the spirit of the human kingdom in the plane of Yetzirah. The division of the spirit at this level is called the Ab by the commissions, Upper Ruach by the Canaanites, Okra or Enkra by the Akons, Uti Wemutu by the Bantu, etc. In addition, this part of the spirit links the thinking principles in man with the fourfold organizing principles in the world, serving thus as an intuitive means of discovering the fourfold organizations in nature. Herein reside the fourth, fifth, and sixth spheres of the tree with their respective deities. Because of their presence, this part of the spirit provides order in the manifestation of events in the world. 4. The Lower Yetzirah in the Canaanite name for the fourth stratum of energy matter differentiation of the objective plane, herein dwells the seventh sphere of the tree, in relation to which the four building elements of the preceding plane are divided into eight building elements and spiritual vehicles which serve as the family's classification set of species. These, in relation to the species creating sphere, Had are further divided into 16, 32, 64, and 256 sets of spiritual vehicles. These latter elements contain the programs or patterns upon which are based the species of things or events in the world. Also found here is the ninth sphere in relation to which generated the vehicle that defines each thing, or event as an individuated spiritual existence. This individuated spirit is called a Ka in the commission tradition. The division of the spirit that contains all of these spheres, 7th, 8th, and ninth, with their respective deities is called the Sahu by the commissions, the Lower Ruat by the Canaanites, the Amandala by the Bantu, and the Ayi by the Yoruba. The phenomenal plane, 5, Ashaya, is the name given to the fifth and lower stratum of the organization of the objective plane. At its densest point, it involves the physical molecules, and on the subtlest, it is made up of energies and substances that have to be classed as physical, yet are subtler than anything thus found by Western scientists. This subtle aspect of Ishaya is called in the occult tradition of Europe the astral light. In the astral division of Ashaya dwells the sixth division of the spirit which was called the Kaibit by the commissions, the Nefesh by the Canaanites, the Ojiji by the Yorubas, the Sumsum by the Akons, the Pranayama Kasha or Linga Saraya by the Hindus, the Itsi Tunsi by the Bantu and the astral body, or the etheric double of European occultism. This part of the spirit is the life vehicle of the physical body. It is that which makes a person live on earth. It is the seat of all physical forces, sensations, desires, emotions, and motivations of the person, i.e., all psychic and physical movement. It is that which breathes and lives on oxygen within the physical existences. Without this part of the spirit, physical bodies are nothing but lifeless shells. The astral division of the spirit is under the jurisdiction of the deities Ra and Geb of the commission tradition and the Kundalini force of Indus Kush. In the lower half of Ashaya, where we find the atomic and molecular organization of physical matter. The part of the spirit dwelling on this plane is the well-known physical body, 
which is called the Kaab by the commissions and the Goop by the Canaanites. It must be noted that in traditional African metaphysics, there is no distinction made between the physical and man's higher bodies, i.e. the physical body is considered an integral part of the spirit, its densest component. The failure to realize that man has seven and not one body, and that all things have a spirit, is one of the major causes of people's stagnation and errors both in thought and action. An integral summary of the above will further elucidate the purpose of each division of the spirit and their relation to each other and the whole. First division of the spirit, the seed of consciousness and identity, the true ego of being. Second and third divisions, the creative organs of being, the will and the spiritual realization power, respectively. Note that while the will is the faculty of potential action, the spiritual power is the vehicle for the actualization of the actions. Fourth division, the administrative organs of being. Once the manifestations are set in motion by the three preceding faculties, the fourth division of the spirit programs them with the laws that will enable them to achieve their respective goals without violating each other's sphere of interest, as all manifestations occur for the sake of the one being of which they are parts and not for and of themselves. Fifth division, the specializing organs of being. It is here that manifestations acquire the spiritual qualities that will distinguish them into families and separate existences. Sixth division, the motive power of being. It is here that each manifested thing receives its breath of life, if living, or electromagnetic motive force, if non-living, to enable it to act upon the physical plane. Seventh division. It is here that each manifestation is finally segregated into an individual existence. This is achieved by receiving a physical body which separates each thing in time and space. The step-by-step -step manifestation of subjective being. The first manifestation. The very first differentiation of energy matter, which in the subjective realm subsists as a homogeneous and undifferentiated vibration, is carried out by Netter's projection of the sound all into it. It creates the first manifestation, in which consciousness looks back into the subjective realm and becomes aware of its original and true essential qualities, that it is eternal and infinite i.e. temporarily and spatially unlimited. In popular literature, this quality of subjective being is called omnipresence. It must be noted that the om um in the word is derived from the heka mantra word of power. Ong then was formed when subjective being projected the sound all into the midst of the undifferentiated energy matter vibrating as the homogeneous sound this sound, incidentally, is hieroglyphically represented by the so-called Ankh cross. This sound in the Indus Valley tradition is called Nada, which is kin to the Spanish term Nada, which holds the same meaning, nothing. I write it NG to signal that it could be rendered either as NG or NK because K and G are variant sounds of the same diction principle. Where K is used in one language, G takes its place in cognate terms. E.G. the English no, the Greek gnosis, and the Sanskrit gnana, variant of jnana and ajna. The second manifestation. Netter projects the sound who into the undifferentiated NG and gives rise to the second manifestation. It too looks back to the subjective realm and becomes aware of another of its essential qualities. Here subjective being dwelling in the objective realm becomes aware of the fact that as its energy matter is essentially unconditioned and undifferentiated, it can will it to assume any conceivable form. 
This aspect of the knowledge of self is the basis of omniscience, infinite knowledge, omni infinite science to know. The third manifestation Netter projects the sound Cre into the undifferentiated NG and gives rise to the third manifestation. It too looks back into the subjective realm and becomes aware of another of its essential qualities. It becomes aware that as its energy matter is essentially unconditioned and undifferentiated, it, the energy matter, can realize anything that is willed for it to become. Thus, subjective being realizes that it is unlimited power of creativity, i.e., it is omnipotent. Thus, the first three objectifications of subjective being is the awareness of its true nature. These three objectifications of the essential attributes of subjective being forms the first three spheres of a cosmogonical diagram known as as the tree of life. Subjective being acts through the second and third manifestations, the infinite will and the unlimited creative power to give rise to the next set of three manifestations. We must note that up to this point, all that has been brought forth is the knowledge of self and the creative vehicles of Netter. The fourth manifestation, Netter projects the sound Shri into the Nada to give rise to the fourth manifestation. For the first time, Netter turns its attention to the things that are to be made. In respect to the making of things, its first act is to look again into the subjective realm, the source of its being, from which it realizes that all things will be modifications of the one being the one consciousness, and the one energy matter rooted in the subjective realm. This first thought about things will therefore be the ruling principle of their existence. This fact is later elaborated into the principles of law, order, and love, mat, the guarantors of oneness in the lower world. The fifth manifestation. Netter projects the sound Hiri into the Nada to give rise to the fifth manifestation. Thoughts are once more about things. This time, for the first time, Netter looks outward to the world to come and focuses on the requirements for experience. Where there is oneness, there is aloneness and no experience. No living, thus in order to live, the one being must be broken into myriads of beings. The underlying substance of all forms which sounded to the homogeneous Eng or NK must scintillate in all colors of the sound spectrum. So Netter becomes aware of the fact that the existence of the world depends on there being differences and opposition. It here guarantees them. The sixth manifestation. Netter projects the sound Hri into the Nada to give rise to the sixth manifestation. Netter looks first back into the subjective realm and next outward and becomes aware that a balance must exist between the principle of oneness of the fourth manifestation and that of opposition of the fifth. It realizes that to live safely and effectively it must be in the world but not of it or be of the subjective but not in it. This is the foundation of the law of equilibrium. What has now been brought forth are the laws that will govern the earthly manifestations of Netter. Three more spheres have now been added to the tree of life. Acting through its creative vehicles, the second and third spheres according to the laws carried out through the fourth to sixth manifestations, Netter creates the next set of three manifestations. The seventh manifestation. Netter projects the sound Kli into the infinite ocean of undifferentiated energy matter to give rise to the seventh manifestation. Looking backward at the subjective realm through the fourth 
and previous manifestations, it realizes that beyond the external differences between things, there must be an emphasis of their interdependence and relation, i.e. a recognition of their oneness in the midst of their differences. This fact is later elaborated into the grouping of things by families. It gives rise to metaphor and harmony. Netter projects the sound I into the infinite nothingness to give rise to the eighth manifestation. Like the fifth, it looks forward into the world, emphasizing the differences between things by focusing on the external differences. The groupings of the preceding sphere are broken into pieces. Here are created the species of things. The ninth manifestation. Netter projects the sound va into the infinite, surfaceless, bottomless waters of life. Ng, nada, undifferentiated energy matter to give rise to the ninth manifestation. Acting on NGK, va creates a mirror-like watery manifestation that captures or reflects all that is exposed to it. It thus integrates all of the preceding manifestations that they may each play their respective role in the generation of individual physical existences. The ninth manifestation is known as the mother of all living things. It gathers the physical elements and forces and coordinates the forces of the other eight manifestations to give rise to physical things. Although the physical plane is considered the tenth manifestation, the commission tree of life correctly limits the spheres to nine, as the tenth sphere is in effect, while the preceding nine are parts of the causative mechanism. The tree of life in the commission tradition is considered under various headings. One of them is the part netero. Thus, does the subjective being proceed from nothingness to physical thingness? Nine emanations integrate its sphere of being. Zero with its sphere of living. Ten. The greatest error that can be made at this point is to interpret the above diagram as an arbitrarily created conceptual or theoretical explanation of the ordering system underlying physical reality. It represents the nine emanations that are the shaping factors of all physical structures and events. They underlie, direct, and integrate all physical realities. From the subtlest sub-electronic forces to the complex of galaxies to the organ systems making up the physical body of man, from the most primitive instinct of a slime mold to the most divine manifestation in the spirit of man, they are what the commissions called the Neteru, Yorubas call the Orishas, and Westerners have translated as deities, archangels, angels, etc. It is very important to understand that contrary to popular opinion, cosmology does not attempt to explain how physical things on the atomic and molecular levels come into being. It concentrates on the coming into being of the metaphysical factors that will function as the vehicles through which the physical things will come into existence as well as the means of regulating their structural and functional components, hence external behavior. In other words, a cosmogony deals with the generation from genus of a system. Properly understood, the terms system and cosmos are synonymous. An assemblage or a combination of things or parts working in unity as a whole, cooperating to carry out the same function, to achieve the same goal, etc. It was said that the emanations, one to nine, are the parts of a system through which subjective being, represented by zero, the absence of things but not of being, creates and administrates physical reality. These are nine deities. The part Neteru composed the organ systems making up the spiritual bodies of all physical things. They link them with their source of being and substance and direct their functions. African religion, better comprehended as a way of life, is based on the understanding of the functioning of these nine metaphysical vessels of creation and administration. 
As they are shaping and governing functions, their activities carry the force of law. For example, you wouldn't attempt to feed on hay because the functions that govern your digestive mechanism can't digest it. It is in this manner that the attributes of the deities, Neteru, Orishas, etc., represent the laws governing our lives on earth. Observance of these laws allows them to fully bring forth their powers through our being, according to our chronological age, state of health, and level of spiritual development. The manifestation of these powers will range from our basis urges to the commonly evolved mental abilities to the psychic abilities held by few to the attainment of divine perfection, i.e. man-godhood on earth. Now we can fully take up the question of monotheism versus polytheism. For the longest time, Westerners have held, one, that monotheism, the belief that there is only one God, is superior to polytheism, the belief in more than one God. Two, that monotheism first appeared in the world with the Hebrews, and that three, monotheism represents a higher evolutionary understanding of divine reality than polytheism. The latter was explicitly or implicitly cited as evidence for the supposed low level of evolutionary attainment of blacks. If you read between the lines, you will see that in all historical, anthropological, and other literature is referred to as modern, progressive, evolved, etc. correspond to Western cultural expressions, and what is referred to as primitive, unevolved, etc. correspond to non-Western cultural expressions. First of all, the above shows clearly that the religion of blacks cannot be classified as polytheistic nor as monotheistic, as these terms are commonly understood. From the earliest appearance of Western man on the historical scene, 2500 B.C., until the end of the 19th century A.D., his thinking and perception of reality for the most part can be described as linear. That is to say that all manifestations are the result of single things acting upon single things. As Western science took a turn for the better toward the end of the 19th century A.D., it began to become more and more apparent that all manifestations in the world were the expression of multiple things coordinating their functions. This new insight received the names of Gestalt theory, field theory, systems theory, and dethroned the belief and expectation of finding anything that was not composed of a multiplicity of co-acting components. It ushered in the host of fantastic scientific technologies that make up today's world, computers, rockets, bioengineering, etc. A study of all of these new systems theories will show that they are all pale versions of the systems theories, cosmogenies, developed by non-Westerners in antiquity and contemporary Africa. The question is begging, why did it take Westerners so long, at least 6,000 years behind blacks, to arrive at this realization? In previous chapters, we detailed the facts concerning Western man's polarization in the left hemisphere of the brain. Now, this part of the brain is only capable of linking sequentially following units, i.e. it is incapable of systems thinking. That is a task that belongs to the right side of the brain with its unlimited integrative capability. Western people would look, for example, at seven integrated sets of one-to-one -one relationships and see seven separate sets of one-to-one -one relationships. On the other hand, blacks and orientals will see one set of seven integrated subsets of one-to-one -one relationships. Polarized in the segregative part of the brain, Westerners could not integrate the host of deities of the black pantheon. They just couldn't see how the many were integral parts of the one. This stuff about co-acting multiple factors shaping and determining each and every physical entity was way beyond them. So they described our religious practice as polytheistic. We must reject it for obvious reasons. And since the term monotheism fails to convey the reality that the one God functions lives through a plurality of integral parts, it too must be rejected. In this book, I will use my coinages, cistheism and syntheism.
Both sin and sis are variants of the same prefix carrying the basic meaning of a whole compounded of several parts. Sis is the root of system and sin that of synthesis, both analogous terms. It was said that the nine emanations direct the behavior of physical things. In the case of humans, this depends on our living in harmony with the laws governing the functioning of the deities. This is due to man's freedom of will to determine the quality of his destiny. Other creatures not possessing this faculty of free will are obligated to follow. In future chapters, we will see how non-Westerners, in following the laws of these emanations operating within their being, achieve personal and social harmony by living a unitary or systematic life. While Westerners, in spite of the claim that they believe in one God, live polytheistically. That is, a way of life in which the various personal and social interests are not integrated. Universal in lip service pluriversal in living. It must be understood that the greatest evil in life, as understood by blacks, was the lack of integration and in thinking, lack of integration between beliefs, feelings, and actions, between the various social interests, etc. Integration in these areas was achieved through their cosmogony and its application to daily living and spiritual practices. Our religion had to be integrable with science, government, economics, medicine, education, and every human institution. It had to integrate all areas of our lives. This idea of Unitarianism, extremely important and highly elevated in our culture, was reinterpreted by Westerners, Europeans, and Semites when they adopted our culture according to their thingish way of thinking. By thingish, thinking is meant the reduction of abstract realities to sense perceptions, while one denotes singularity, one apple, one book, etc. Unity denotes the abstract tie between a plurality of things. Thus, the belief in and living as the Unitarian God was reduced to the belief in the one God and the disintegrative way of living. Once more, we must see that this thingish or materialistic way of thinking belongs to the left side of the brain. Relational thinking, which is needed to understand the black understanding of God and religion, is the property of the right side of the brain. Once the true nature, purpose, and functions of a cosmogony is fully understood, it will be realized that it is to religion and all life sciences what mathematics is to science and the periodical table of elements is to chemistry and more. The great strides and progress made by Western scientists with the appearance of their systems theories which made their prior progress look seemingly slow by comparison must be equated with the great strides and progress made by blacks when they were founding civilization while Westerners at the time were still in the Paleolithic situation. End of chapter 5. Please support this channel by clicking on the links below. The Medjun Letter, Volume 1, Chapter 6, An Analysis of the Cosmogonical System, The First Act of Manifestation. The Supreme Being brings itself out of the subjective state. Before creation can begin, the Supreme Being must first make objective its qualities of being. Note that in the subjective state, there cannot even be so much as a single thought. The very first manifestation of a thought is already a process of objectification. The only consciousness that there is, is that of consciousness being aware that it is conscious. Creation then is preceded by a process whereby the Supreme Being brings itself into manifestation. The first act of manifestation, which corresponds to the first sphere of the Tree of Life, Kether, is the Supreme Being's identification with the unlimited potential and unlimited presence in space, infiniteness and time, eternalness, of the subjective realm. 
i.e. the supreme being, brings forth the awareness that its identity is the capability of being whatever it chooses to be, and that it is immortal and eternal. The second act of manifestation. The supreme being brings forth its creative faculties. The second act of manifestation is the supreme being's bringing forth of its creative faculties. These are the will and its spiritual power. The divine will, the second sphere of the tree of life, is the faculty that indicates what will take place and is thus the initiator of creative events. At this level, there is the awareness that as the energy matter from which all things are made is an eternal and infinite continuum. No part of it can have a separate existence in time or space. Therefore, all things are part of the whole and are related to and interdependent upon each other. From another perspective, this states that no thing has a quality in itself, that qualities are the result of a thing's relationship to the whole and to other things. As we shall see later in this book, that the intuitive and automatic operation of this principle in man's thinking is the foundation of wisdom. The creative faculty of the supreme being at the second sphere is therefore the divine wisdom. It is omniscient. It is also realized that the will is infinite in its potential to initiate activities as the energy matter which will carry them out is essentially unlimited. The spiritual power, the third sphere, like the second sphere, looks back to the subjective realm and the essential state of being and realizes that as the energy matter that is the basis of all creations is essentially unlimited, there are no limitations to its ability to carry out what is willed by the second sphere. It is the divine omnipotence. Note that the will is the potential, while the spiritual power is the actualizer or producer of the effect in the world. The six acts of creation. Now that the supreme being has brought itself and its creative faculties out of the subjective realm, the process of creation can begin. But before the physical creatures can be created, there is a need for the creation of a metaphysical system of government or directors and metaphysical entities that will carry out the work of administering the physical world. The creation of the celestial government. The first act of creation. The first act of creation, which corresponds to the fourth sphere of the tree of life, is the framing of the laws reflecting the workings of the forces of the third sphere. These forces are deployed through a structure that allocates to all things its place in time and space for the purpose of maintaining order in the world. The tree of life, the canons of divine laws, the cosmogonies, mandalas, etc. are all representations of this grand structure. It corresponds to the fourth sphere of the tree. It is important to realize that order is not merely a fixed plan or a regular series or a law of arrangement, etc. Where there is no more than one entity, there can be no order. And where a number of things are not related or interdependent, there is implicitly no order or the possibility thereof. Order is essentially dependent on the existence of the interdependence, oneness between things. It is the means of safeguarding their mutual dependence. The full import of this will be realized when full consideration is given to the fact that the goal of creation is the division of a whole, the one energy matter, into an infinitude of parts or things. The second act of creation. Next is created the means of enforcing order, the fifth sphere. Nothing can encroach upon another. Yet, although things are protected, the chief interest is the preservation of the whole. The third act of creation. Next is created the faculty through which the metaphysical workers will be coordinated in their activities to bring forth and administrate the physical creatures. This is the work of the sixth fear. The work of the coordination is based upon the canon of the fourth sphere. Its application 
to specific situations is communicated to the sixth sphere by the second sphere. The creation of the celestial workers. Now that the means of establishing and maintaining order are in place, the supreme being proceeds to create the faculties or deities that are directly in charge of the work of creating the physical entities, the fourth act of creation. Next is created the faculty through which the designs of the various species of beings will take place. What is actually achieved at this point the seventh sphere is an image of the type of thing that is to be created, e.g. the species tiger. The emphasis of our understanding must be placed on the ordering function of images. When we imagine something, although we may not realize it, we are organizing the shaping forces of things or events to a defined objective. The imaginative faculty takes the set of forces governing a particular set of events or things and organizes it into a concrete objective. It is the great celestial designer, inventor, artist, goddess of beauty, harmony, etc. The fifth act of creation. In the preceding stage, we arrived at the design of the species of things. But as we know, Species are broken down into individual existences. This faculty, the eighth sphere, has the task of making the distinctions that will distinguish each member of a species from another by creating variations amongst the parts of things and events. The sixth act of creation. The next faculty created, the ninth sphere, uses all of the preceding shaping factors to make a vehicle that will serve to coordinate physical energy matter into the physical thing or event. This vehicle is the soul of the individual thing or event. In the Kemetic tradition, it is called the Ka, and in the Hindu tradition, the Jivan Atma. Because this faculty is directly in charge of the organization of physical energy matter into the creature, it is referred to as the mother goddess creator of all the living and of the earth. Aset, Yamaya, Nana S, etc. The preceding exposition of the creative process is one of the best examples of the claim by Kabbalists that the mythologies and religious scriptures of nations cannot be fully understood without the knowledge of Kabbalah. The above six acts or stages of creation correspond to the original and true understanding that was misrepresented by the biblical version as the six days of creation. We must also note that in mythological symbolism, the will, second sphere, is personified as a male, and the spiritual power, third sphere, as a female. This is to be understood by the fact that we are free to express our will to do something at any time in the same manner that a male is always ready to impregnate a female. Our spiritual power, however, is only receptive to being impregnated at fixed recurring points in a cycle. E.g., women can only be impregnated at the midpoint between menstruations. Thus, we can paraphrase the second act of manifestation, the supreme beings bringing forth of its creative faculties as the supreme beings bringing forth of its generative organs. And because man is made in the creative likeness of God, Genesis 1.26, i.e. with the same creative faculties, Genesis 1.27 informs us that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There are many factors that prove that the male and female correspond to the divine will, second sphere, and the divine spiritual power, sphere three. In the original Hebraic version of the Bible, the word translated as God is Alim, or Elohim. The word is composed of El, the Canaanite name for God, and Him, a suffix indicating plurality. This is why the God speaking at Genesis 1.26 says, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. The author of this text has simply personified the true creative faculties of God. An Analysis of the Process of Creation 
the creative activity of the fourth sphere. According to the Tree of Life cosmogonical system, the act of creation is carried out by the first sphere using its two creative faculties, spheres two and three. The first act of creation, which occurs at the fourth sphere, is the framing of the law embodying the activities of the set of metaphysical forces of the third sphere, which act as the structural framework upon which is built the physical world and each thing in the world. It would be appropriate, according to the demands of the order, for presenting the details of cosmology, to embark at this point upon an explanation of the blueprint of the entire physical realm. Such a task requires certain supportive information that cannot be given at this time in the discourse. I will therefore explain the blueprint of creation through one of its minor applications. Let's consider the creation of the animal kingdom. Animals, like all other members of the world spirits, deities, humans, vegetables, and minerals, are modifications of the universal energy matter and pure consciousness of the subjective realm. This oneness of origin, we said earlier, is the basis of order. According to the cosmogonical forces operating in the third sphere and framed into law at the fourth sphere, all animals are parts of a circle of manifestation that encompasses all modes of forces making up living beings. When the universal subjective energy matter differentiates itself to bring forth living things, it dualizes itself into two modes of energy. For the sake of simplicity, I will for now simplify the explanation by skipping certain steps and details and state that one of the forces is the source of the thermal heat factor, Shu, that determines the level of biochemical activities. The other force is the source of the hydration, or water factor, Tefnut, which represents the universal medium in which all living things dwell. The upper and lower boundaries of the thermal factor for specific living forms are relatively denoted as hot and cold. The upper and lower boundaries of the hydration of bodies are denoted as moist and dry. Mediation on the subject will show that all biological activities can be reduced and explained by these two modalities. The interaction of these two factors produces the four modalities underlying all manifestations in the world. They have been symbolized as the four elements of alchemy. 1. Water is cold and moist. Water accumulates in bodies as they cool down. 2. As bodies begin to heat up and have not yet lost their humidity, they are metaphorized as air hot and moist. 3. When the temperature rises to the upper range and bodies lose their humidity, they are metaphorized as fire, hot and dry. 4. When they begin to cool down but have not yet regained their moisture, they are metaphorized as earth, cold and dry. All bodies go through these changes daily with the rise and fall of temperature that follows the sun. The same happens during the course of the year. Besides being applicable to the cyclical changes that life forms go through, these four elements are also used as classification sets for the four fundamental types of all manifestations. Thus, there are four fundamental types or temperaments of animals, vegetables, minerals, and humans. Applied to the types of animals, we get the following. Ferocious, predators, fiery, tigers, lions, etc., carnivores, non-predators, airy, or hot or moist, rhinoceros, elephants, etc., vegetarians. Non-ferocious, passive, watery, cold, moist, sheep, doves, etc. Non-passive, earthy, cold, dry, hyenas, jackals, buzzards, scavengers, omnivores. To summarize in the creation of animals, what is achieved at the fourth sphere is the creation of the four temperaments of the animal kingdom. As each of these symbols of temperaments, the elements, ties a vast number of types of beings together across lines of genre and kingdoms, the activity of the fourth sphere is of a synthetical and 
and illogical nature. The creative activities of the fifth sphere. The next step in the creative process which occurs in the fifth sphere is the separation of the beings of each temperamental set. As they are held together through the analogs of the fourth sphere, their separation is called analysis. We will later have a full discussion on the incorrect views that are popularly held about this mental process, as well as its opposite, synthesis. Here at the fifth sphere, fiery animals are analyzed into the various genre of predators, feline, the general class for all types of cats, canine, etc. The same is done for the other temperaments. The creative activity of the seventh sphere. We must pay particular attention to the fact that the creative acts of the fourth and fifth spheres are on the abstract plane. Images cannot be formed of fiery or earthly animals or plants, etc. Neither can they be formed of felines or bovines. It is at the seventh sphere that we arrive at the images of the members of the general sets of creatures. In place of felines, for example, now we have tigers, leopards, etc. The creative activity of the eighth sphere. In the eighth sphere, dogs, horses, tigers, etc. are distinguished into specific dogs, etc. Here we get the distinctions that set Lassie apart from the Kali matrix created in the seventh sphere. The duality principle in cosmogony. Let's recall the fact that the entire expanse of reality can be divided into two all comprehensive divisions, the subjective and the objective realms. The subjective realm corresponds to the supreme being's essential or unmodified nature, while the objective corresponds to its conditioned or modified nature, i.e. the infinite eternal source of all things versus the infinite time condition plane wherein things dwell. Whatever was, is, and shall be must fall into one of these two all-comprehensive categories. Thus, at the most fundamental level of classification, we find an indivisible duality of being. By indivisible duality, usually contracted to individuality, it is obviously meant that the two modes of being are complementary halves. This duality manifests itself in all areas and on all levels of being as a major organizing force. In order to understand God, ourselves, the world, and life, we must be able to identify, understand, and live in harmony with the dualizing, shaping forces of life. In the subjective realm, the duality manifests itself on one hand as consciousness, will, two polarities of the same reality, and on the other as energy and matter. The former is referred to in the Kabbalistical tradition as Ayin and Amen in the commission. The latter is Sof and Nu or Nut in the Kabbalistical and the commission traditions respectively. The dualization of subjective being. Consciousness, matter, will, Energy, Ain, Sof, Amen, Nu or Nut. The dualization of objective being. In the objective realm, we also have two fundamental divisions the nominal or metaphysical planes wherein dwell the deities, spheres one through nine, on one hand, and on the other, the phenomenal or physical realm, sphere ten. In order to make this information useful in our daily lives, we must first note that both the subjective and objective realms are indivisible halves of absolute being. We saw that without the objective realm, with all of its limitations, the supreme being cannot have experience. This enables us to reject such pseudo-spiritual teachings that deny the validity of objective existence with its phenomenal manifestations. They are there to give the supreme being experience. What is important, missed by the pseudo-sages, is 
the maintenance of the equilibrium between the dualities on their respective levels. The doctrine of equilibrium, we will see, is the major theme of cosmology, the tree of life and of living. These two fundamental divisions of our being, the subjective and objective factors, reside in our being as primordial driving forces. The failure to satisfy either of them, as the subjective is denied in the West and the objective by Hinduism, Aryanized yogic philosophy, leads to serious problems in life. The Complementary Dualities on the Tree of Life In order to use the Tree of Life as a means of ordering our thinking and our living, it is necessary to understand the complementary relations between certain sets of spheres. Zero and sphere ten obviously represent the two extreme polarities of the expanse of reality. They stand in relation to each other as source and goal. Source, infinite potential. Goal, Infinite beings, source, explicit oneness, goal, implicit oneness, source, freedom, goal, limitation, source, new, goal, geb. The one to nine complementary relation. While sphere one looks back to the subjective realm and identifies with the infinite potential of being of the unstructured energy matter, Sphere 9, as the soul of the individual physical creation, identifies with each physical being. We shall later see that this duality is the basis of individuation of human consciousness into self and person, or higher and lower selves, or alter ego and ego. Selflessness and selfishness that has not escaped the attention of many spiritualists and psychologists. In the comedic tradition, it is the well-known complement of Osar and Oset, or Osiris and Isis. The two to eight complementary relation. While sphere two, the wisdom faculty, is concerned with the interdependence and relationships, unity between things, and their place in time and space, sphere eight the linear logical faculty is concerned with creating differentiations, disunity between members of the same species by varying their parts. The former is integrative, while the latter is segregative. In addition, the thought processes of sphere 2 are purely abstract, while that of sphere 8 is concrete. The subtle particles atoms, electrons, making up all things are in a state of constant vibration, Western science informs us, and all other vibrations generate sound waves in one medium or another. We can paraphrase the foregoing by stating that sound waves underlie the structure of all things and events. This has been known by African spiritual scientists since prehistoric times who have taught that the third sphere is the vehicle from where is generated the sound waves that underlie, create, maintain, and destroy the structure of all things and events in the world. These sounds are the words of power, mantras, hiku, etc. of spiritual cultures. Words of power have a special relationship with the faculty of imagination, the seventh sphere. As anyone who has successfully worked on mantras knows, chanting them results in the filling of the sphere of awareness with a certain set of images that are specific to each mantra. In other words, before these special sound waves can affect their desired objectives, they must be translated into the images that literally serves as matrices for the physical manifestations. This relationship between the third and seventh spheres has led dabblers into the esoteric to mistakenly believe that the imagination, unaided by words of power, can affect changes in the physical plane. Quote, Nurture a clear image of what you want with faith, and in time you will have it, many books have told us. The half-truth in this belief is the reason it works only some of the time. The truth regarding magic, 
success and failure is a very simple one. All events, talents, etc. in a person's life are created by the sound waves, mantras, hikau, words of power that are in an active state. Where these sound waves forms are in a latent state, then there will be the absence of the talents that they govern. The nurturing of an image without awakening its associated sound wave is like trying to incubate an unfertilized egg. The subject is a rich one, and we will return to it many times in the course of this book. The 4 to 6 Complementary Relation we have seen that the fourth sphere corresponds to the blueprint upon which the world and all physical events are built. The sixth sphere corresponds to the faculty that governs the metaphysical beings, spheres 7, 8, and 9, that are in charge of creating physical reality and maintaining order within it, according to the blueprint of the fourth sphere. The tree of life shows that the creative process of the world is based on a plan in which all the things in the world are modifications of one and the same material substance and being. Although they are different in their needs, modes of existence and appearance, they are all parts of one whole. The equilibrium between this oneness at the top and difference on the bottom must be maintained. This is the function of the fifth sphere. In order to carry out this mediating role, the fifth sphere must be unrelated to all others. It is thus posited at the exact center of the entire span of reality. End of chapter 6. Please support this channel by clicking on the links below.